Uh, welcome to this talk, Full Stack Java Development with Spring Boot. My name is Dan Vega. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate at VMware. There is a QR code up there. If you go ahead and scan it, it'll take you to a GitHub repo that contains all the code we're going to go through today, as well as a PDF of all the slides that we're going to talk, talk through today. Uh, if you don't get it, don't worry. I'm going to show you the repo in a little bit, uh, so we'll get into that. So one of the things, this is my first code at the code on the beach, and one of the things I've kind of appreciated here is just the diverse amount of tech that, that we're talking about. But I haven't talked to a lot of Java developers yet. So raise your hand if you're doing Java. All right, good, that's most of us. How about Spring Boot? All right, good. So for those who are doing Spring Boot, uh, I think you'll get a few tips and tricks out of this when, when kind of working with a full stack. For those of you not doing Spring Boot, don't worry, we're gonna kind of walk through how to create a new Spring Boot app, what it is, and what it does. So, uh, A little bit about me, uh, I'm a husband and a father. Uh, my wife, Jen, our two daughters, Isabella and Juliana. Uh, we live outside of Cleveland, Ohio. I've been doing this for a little over 20 years now in a whole bunch of different roles. Uh, the recent one is being a Spring Developer Advocate, and uh, before, long before VMware started giving me a paycheck, I've been an advocate for Spring, so this isn't something I just uh, am getting paid to do. I actually enjoy working with the framework and have been for a while. So, uh, I'm also a content creator. If you head over to danvega.dev, that's my personal website. There's a lot of free stuff there, uh, articles. Uh, I'm a YouTuber as well. Uh, I also create courses. Uh, I'm lucky, lucky enough to have over like 150,000 students around the world, which is still just like mind-boggling to me. Uh, just kind of the era that we live in that we can kind of teach and, and learn together just kind of around the world. So that's really cool. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, at the real Dan Vega. Uh, that crazy SpaceX guy is not going to own it. So if you're not there, go ahead and join. Uh, start a conversation there. If you have any questions about what we're going to talk about, feel free to reach, uh, reach me there. So I also do a live stream. This is a pretty new show that we're doing called Spring Office Hours. Now, there's a long URL at the bottom. There's a shorter one at the top. Really what this show is is uh, there's a whole bunch of projects in the Spring community. This is our opportunity to kind of talk to you on a live stream uh, with my friend Deshaun and coworker. And we kind of just get on and talk about what's new in the Spring world each week. We, we may do one talk. We may do mul or multiple live streams a week. Uh, show off some demos, and then more, most importantly, this is an opportunity for you to come bring your questions. So if there's something that you're facing, you know, I always wish I had a place to go ask some questions that wasn't Stack Overflow or Reddit, where people just kind of yell at me and call me stupid. Um, this is a gr really great place to kind of ask your questions. If you have like a specific, like, how do I get this done? Uh, maybe that's like a Stack Overflow kind of question, but if you want to come and talk about like, hey, um, why, why, why do we prefer constructor injection in Spring over everything else, you know, in, as far as dependency injection goes? This is a great place to ask those questions, get them answered, and have kind of a discussion about them. So check that out. So quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. Uh, I want to start with what is a full stack developer? Depending on who you ask, you might get some different answers. So I want to kind of talk through that. So for me, uh, we're going to talk about both the back end and the front end. And once we kind of break this down and, and create a couple different apps, we're going to talk about some of the architecture decisions that go into kind of building these applications. And we'll have a, a little bit of room for Q&A, hopefully. So what is a full stack developer? Uh, again, I, I mentioned this before, but I think depending on who you ask, you're going to get different answers. Uh, some people have even told me that it's a scam made up by the industry to basically pay one developer for two jobs. I am not in that camp, but if you believe that, that's okay. Um, so the most important thing to understand is that a full stack developer is not a full snack developer. I was really disappointed when uh, I, I realized that this was not going to be my title, but here we are. I, one of the strangest things is when you go search for full stack, there's all these different spellings, right? So I think one of the things we should talk about is how do you spell full stack so that when we're going to search for answers, or we're writing something down, we understand how to spell it. So don't ever use just the one word, full stack, that is not appropriate in any term. The two appropriate ones are full space stack and then full hyphen stack. And it really depends on the context in which you're talking about it. So if you're using it as a noun, you can use two words. Hi, my name is Dan. I'm a developer working on the full stack. If you're using it to describe something, hi, my name is Dan. I'm a full stack developer. We want to make sure we're using that hyphenated word. 
So I, I know it's silly, but in the past I've searched for all three things and you come up with different answers. So if we all start using the right ones, we could probably get the right answers. So the two words in full stack developer here, um, developer, you know, there's a lot that goes into being a developer, more than just writing code, right? We all understand that. Um, there's a lot of soft skills that go into being a developer. You know, we work with people, not, not just somebody who's good at writing code. But for the purpose of this talk, I do want to just kind of focus on the code, port, co code portion. So when I talk about a developer in this sense, we're just talking about someone who is writing code. The full stack part is, again, where kind of different answers will come up. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you my belief, my definition of what a full stack developer is. This is not the law. This is not, this is not go forward and tell everyone that Dan said this. Um, this is just what I believe. So as far as a full stack go developer goes, I believe that as someone who can work on the entire stack, uh, so this is from the front end to the back end, and knows how to get something to production. Now, as we'll see, that doesn't necessarily mean you're involved in every step of going to production, but you should at least understand how to get to production. So on the front end, you should understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Seems pretty simple. Those three buckets are pretty big buckets. Uh, it takes us a while to get really good at all three of those. We'll talk more about that in a second. On the back end, you should understand a programming language. In our, in, uh, in our case today, we're going to talk about Java and a framework, which is Spring. Um, but you know, this, you know, there are different stacks across, you know, depending on what stack you're working on. We're specifically kind of focused on like a web application today, but there are other stacks. But um, a lot of the, the languages and frameworks that you work with today can do a lot of the same things. Uh, today we're going to focus on kind of Java and Spring. So for me, front end, back end. Now again, there's a lot that goes into those three buckets, um, uh, those two buckets really. Uh, so on the front end side, when you're working with HTML, you need to understand things like document object model, tags, attributes, how to build forms. Semantic HTML is a big thing these days, right? Like not just using divs everywhere. Uh, Chris, my buddy Chris is giving a talk later on accessibility. So understanding, you know, accessibility shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be something that we're all thinking of as we're building out our applications. Uh, CSS is a lot that goes into understanding CSS. Uh, CSS has come a long way. And there are a lot of cool things like uh, Grid and Flexbox, being able to create these nice responsive designs frameworks these days. I'm a big Tailwind fan, and I'll use it today, but there are other frameworks out there as well. Uh, JavaScript. So JavaScript, as we'll get into in a minute uh, or a little bit later, has come a long way since, since I've started writing JavaScript. And uh, so specifically, modern JavaScript is really uh, something that we want to focus in and learn on. Uh, things like build tools and frameworks. On the back end, again, you kind of pick a programming language. In our case, we're going to use Java. In the Spring world, you can use things like Groovy and Kotlin, which are dynamic languages. Uh, you need to understand build tools. So build tools are things like Maven and Gradle. Uh, pick a framework. So we're talking about Spring framework today. There's other great frameworks in the uh, Java ecosystem, like Micronaut and Quarkus. Uh, testing utilities, things like JUnit 5, Makito, Hamcrest. There's a whole bunch of them. And then databases, talking to a relational database or a non-relational database. So those are kind of the front end and the back end. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff in between that we need to know, right? So how does the internet work? Things like version control, uh, being efficient in our IDEs, our, our Visual Studio codes, our IntelliJs, and understanding tools, things like our command line and how to use Chrome DevTools. So again, there, there's a lot that goes into this. And you start to, to like feel a little bit overwhelmed with everything that's going on. Then we have to talk about what about DevOps, because DevOps is an important part of the software development lifecycle, right? It's not enough to just write code. We need to build it, test it, release, deploy, operate, monitor. But who's responsible for this? Um, so this is where some of the kind of uh, different answers will come in. For me, I believe you know, as a full stack developer, you should understand how to get something to production. Now, depending on where you work or what your day job is, you may not need to understand uh, Kubernetes or containers or however that stuff works. Um, and you may not be involved in that kind of you know, workflow. Uh, thankfully, we have really smart people who work in DevOps who can kind of help us with a lot of this stuff. So for me, again, it's understanding the full stack, so front end, back end, and just kind of understanding how we can get something to production. So 
we learn all that stuff. We know that um, there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, we're now a full stack developer. We should understand everything and know everything inside and out, right? No. <laughs> there's a lot there. And you know, again, I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I don't know all that stuff. So I can't even imagine how uh, much anxiety that must give somebody getting into kind of full stack development. Your job as a full stack developer is to understand the breadth of things, not the depth of things. Now, you could be, you could understand some things more than others. Maybe you, you really understand JavaScript. Maybe on the back end, you really like Java. Um, but to understand everything inside and out is just not going to happen. So don't worry about that. OK, so let's talk about back end development. So we're going to talk uh, about Java and Spring today. But again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, whatever kind of stack that you're on, whatever language you're using, whatever framework you're using, a lot of the things that we're doing uh, as far as like building web applications today, uh, you will find in a lot of the languages and frameworks. So if you haven't been around Java lately, or maybe you've used Java a long time ago and you're kind of coming back to it, um, Java's done a lot lately. And I think a lot of the innovation in Java has really come from the time-bound six-month cadence releases that we are in now. So we used to release Java, you know, hundreds of features at three or four years in, in between uh, releases. And, and that was kind of problematic, just as we know in our day-to-day -day jobs. Like if we release, you know, a couple times a year, we're releasing a whole bunch of features, and, and lots of things can go wrong with that. Um, so we now have the six-month release cadence in Java. So we have non-LTS releases, which are long-term support. Um, so these are the things that happen with a non-LTS. But with LTS supports, uh, these are kind of recommended for production workloads. Um, this started with version 11. And this is approximately every three years apart, except now the next long-term support will be two years. So we'll see that in a second. But again, long-term supports are happening. Six-month releases are happening, or new releases are happening every six months. And so we, if we kind of look at that timeline, if we go back to March of 2014, uh, Java, Java 8 was released. And then each of the one of the ones on the top are long-term support. So Java 11, Java 17. Uh, the next one will be uh, Java 21 in September of 2023. So we're currently in Java 18. And kind of the reason that I say this is, who is, is, is anybody on work, at work still on Java 8 over here? I know there's some people. <laughs> what were you guys doing during the pandemic? <laughs> you had a whole pandemic to get upgraded there. Um, the reason I say this is because if we look at this list, this is just from Java 11 to Java 17. And these are kind of really just the um, highlights of what has happened since Java 11. So on top of all the performance and all of the security updates, these are features that you're missing out on by not kind of upgrading. And with this new, uh, the way that we're kind of releasing every six months and the way that the long-term support is now available two years later, um, it's really a time to, to kind of reevaluate and see if we can't upgrade. Um, and the reason I bring a lot of this up is because in the Spring world, so Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3, which are coming in November of this year, we are moving to a JDK 17 baseline. And that may seem aggressive, considering that we support you know, Java 8 and Java 11 now. Um, but if we start to look at the cadence, the release cadence, it, it makes a little bit more sense. So, I just want to talk a little bit about what's coming in Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3. So we talked about JDK 17. Uh, so if you upgrade, you will need to be on, on, on JDK 17. Um, the Jakarta EE. So uh, this Java EE was owned by Oracle. At some point, they just stopped updating it. Uh, for, I don't, we still have no answers of what happened there. Um, but there were no more updates happening in the Java EE space. So at some point, they decided, OK, we're going to donate this to the Apache Foundation. And now that is you know, Jakarta. So now we're going to start getting updates in Jakarta. One thing that's going to happen, though, is in all of your applications that you're using today, if you're using that Java X namespace somewhere, we're going to have to rename that namespace to Jakarta EE. That should be fairly easy on your part. If you're using an IDE, you can probably do that pretty quickly. But that is a change that's happening. And it's a good change, because like I said, we're going to start getting updates in that Jakarta EE space now. 
There's a new observability initiative happening around Micrometer with Spring Framework 6, uh, just to kind of combine a lot of the tracing and metrics into one, uh, one project. A big project that is coming is uh, Spring Native. And this was you know, one, of, one of the things that I've heard from the engineers at uh, VMware here <coughs> is that this is one of the biggest initiatives the Spring team has taken on. And that's because what we're doing there is we're doing ahead of time compilation. So there are lots of pros and uh, trade-offs for this. Uh, but one of the things is we can basically create a native executable now. And we can run it on whatever machine you need to run on. This really helps out with speed, uh, which helps out with using less memory. And so if you wanted to get into something like serverless development, this is very important. Uh, Java's never really been good in the serverless space, um, partly because of you know, cold start times or uh, things like that. Uh, Spring Native is going to help this uh, with the help of Graal VM. Uh, so this is a big, big initiative. And you can actually use it today. So if you are on start.spring.io, uh, you can actually pull in uh, the Spring Native dependency. When we move to Spring Boot 3, this is all going to be kind of baked in. Uh, so we'll have the opportunity to go ahead and, and, and natively compile our applications. Another cool thing is declarative HTTP clients. So instead of having to use something like uh, web client or um, REST template, you can kind of declare an interface and say, these are the uh, exchanges I want to have. And it will get picked up by Spring and actually create a client for you. So, um, some cool things coming in Spring Boot 3. Again, the reason I mentioned that is in November, that's where we're heading. You can see JDK 17 on the left there, uh, September of 2021. You know, when we kind of announced it, it seemed like a big initiative that we were kind of moving the baseline to Java 17. But if we look at the timeline and the way that Java is releasing, uh, it really doesn't seem like that. Again, uh, just next year, we'll have JDK 21 uh, as the new long-term support. Cool. So that's all I wanted to kind of talk about. Uh, what I want to do now is just build out a, a basic Spring Boot application that we're going to use in our kind of full stack architecture here. And we'll walk through that. So again, uh, I mentioned I had that QR code up there. Uh, if you didn't get it, if you head over to github, uh, dan, github.com slash danvega and look for full stack Java Spring. There is uh, a couple, you know, a few folders here with some of the demos we're going to work on, and then uh, the slides. And so if you're new to Spring and you want to create a new Spring application, a Spring Boot application, you can go to start.spring.io. This is a great place to kind of bootstrap an application. So you're given some choices here. And uh, the first choice is, hey, what do you want to use, Maven or Gradle? Uh, so I'm choosing Maven. What is the language you're going to use? So by default, this is Java. But if you wanted to move to a dynamic language like Kotlin or Groovy, you can do that. Then you're going to pick the Spring Boot version that you're using. So by default, I didn't show this, but it would uh, default to whatever the current version is, so 2.7.2. .2. I'm actually going to choose Spring Boot 3, uh, uh, Milestone 4, just to kind of show off uh, one new feature that, that I'm really excited for. So let me go in and, and fill out some things about our application. So I may have a group here. We're going to build a reading list application just to kind of manage some books. Um, we're going to use jar, and we're going to use Java 17. So now this dependencies, uh, these are the dependencies in your application. I kind of like to um, think about this as if I was hosting a dinner party tonight and I knew what I was going to make. I would jot down a bunch of things on a, a piece of paper, uh, ingredients that I wanted to, that I needed to get from the supermarket. Uh, that way, when I got to the supermarket, I knew exactly what I need. I can just go through and kind of pick them out. These are the dependencies of your application. What are you kind of building today? So if I go ahead and hit this, I'm going to build a Spring web application. So this is the Spring MVC support. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, I'm going to do some work with the database. I want to connect to a database. I want to read some records. Uh, to do that, I'm going to use something called Spring Data JDBC. Um, so you may have heard of JPA. That's kind of the Hibernate, uh, Hibernate implementation. JDBC kind of is in between that and just straight JDBC template. This allows us to um, easily get some out of the box uh, functionality so we don't have to write like you know, all the CRUD methods to access information from a database. So now that I have that, I also need some type of database driver, right? What database am I going to connect to? 
So in the real world, I might use something like Postgres or MySQL. Here in this demo, I'm just going to use H2, which is an in-memory database. Um, and it's just uh, basically restart. Every time we restart the application, it creates, a new, um, creates new tables, uh, wipes everything out. Um, this is a good thing for just kind of demos and prototyping. So these are the dependencies of the application. Um, little tip, if you ever want to see what kind of code you're going to be starting with, you can click this Explore button. It shows you all the code that is going to get um, kind of uh, generated for you. So at that point, you can hit Generate, download the zip file, open it up in your IDE. I've gone ahead and done that already, just so we don't have to wait for IDEs to open. That's always fun to watch. So in a Spring Boot application, we have a main application class. This is our reading list application. And if we go in here, uh, one thing I like to do is just go ahead and run the application just to make sure uh, nothing uh, is going wrong, that we didn't do anything wrong when you generate our application. Usually, it's just to make sure that I'm not conflicting with another port that's already running. So now that we have our application up and running, we need to go through and start creating some um, classes. So the first thing I want to do is create a model package. And this will be a place where I can kind of write some uh, models in our application, which kind of describe the objects that we're going to use in our app. So I'm going to go ahead and create new. I'll say Java class. This is going to be a book. And this is also going to be a record. So since we're on a modern version of Java here, we could take advantage of records. And records allow us to uh, write this uh, nice, succinct, immutable class without having all these getters and setters. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and say this, and just so I don't mess anything up. So we have a record that has an uh, integer ID, a uh, string title, a number of pages, an author, and then status. And we need to go ahead and create a status in here. So I'm going to say new Java class. This is status. This is going to be an enum. And a status could be not completed be in progress, or it could be completed. Just kind of the status of where I am with reading that book. OK, so we have our model. Now what we need to do is we need to kind of create a way to access uh, information in our database. And for that, we're going to create a repository. And here, we'll create a new And this is going to be an interface. So this is where kind of Spring Data comes into play. So Spring Data allows us to um, create these repositories. This is an interface. This really isn't going to do anything right now. But once we go ahead and extend something that's in the Spring Data, there are a bunch of different Spring Data repositories. Uh, one of the new ones, and one of the reasons I selected Spring Boot 3 is because in, Spring, in the newer versions of Spring Data, we have this thing called a list, cr list CRUD repository. And in the generic CRUD repository, we usually work, work with things like iterables. And most of the time, we're not working with iterables. We're working with lists in Java, and we want to work with a list. So we can use this list CRUD repository. And all this does now is we get uh, some return types for like find all and find, find all by ID. We get a list as a return type and not an iterable. But we still have all of the CRUD functionality. At the end of the day, all these repositories do is allow us to just create this interface. At runtime, Spring will create a concrete imp implementation of this and give us all that functiona functionality out of the box. So we don't have to write um, all that basic stuff to read information, persist information. We kind of get that just by declaring this interface. So I'm going to save that. Next thing we'll need is a, oops. So we'll need a controller. A controller is going to be a way for us to kind of request information. Uh, the controller is going to handle the requests and the responses in our API. So we're going to say book controller. Uh, we're going to mark this as a REST controller. And we're going to give it a request mapping of um, slash API slash books. And that's just how it's going to respond. So again, when we hit slash API slash books, we'll be inside of this REST controller. 
Now again, we, we created that repository before. We want to bring that repository into this controller because we're going to use that to kind of get information in and out of our database. So I'm going to create a new um, private final book repository. We'll just call this repository. And then what we're doing here is we're adding an argument to our constructor. So Spring sees this before, you know, in the old days of Spring, you'd have to say mark this with at auto wire to, to in, in, uh, kind of tell Spring, hey, I want you to auto wire in, in, uh, an instance of this into the controller. If there's only a single controller, though, Spring will see that and say, hey, book repository, I have an instance of that in the application context. I can go ahead and auto wire that in for you. So we're getting an instance of our repository. So we can create a new method here. We'll say um, we want a list of books. And then, yep, and we'll call this find all. And then we can just use that repository that we had and call the find all method. Again, that find all method was because we created that interface that extended that list CRUD repository. So we're getting that functionality to get all of the books in the database right out of the box. One last thing, I'm just going to put a get mapping on this. This just says, hey, if you hit slash API slash books, and then basically that, that um, request mapping, this is the method that's going to be, get called. So we have kind of the infrastructure of this application up and running. We just have the database bits kind of missing, right? So. One thing we can do with JDBC here is we can create a new file in our resources folder, and we can call this schema.sql. And I'm just going to go ahead and add some of this schema. We don't really need that. And all this says is, hey, go ahead and create a table in the database called book. I want you to create some columns, ID, title, pages, author, and status. And so once the application starts up, by convention, it will look for SQL files here, or a specific SQL file called schema. In our resources folder, pick that up, execute this SQL. We now have a book uh, table or a book table in our database. So that would all be great. We need one more way to kind of maybe populate some data in our database. I could add some uh, SQL, SQL here um, to go ahead and insert some new rows if I wanted to. I prefer writing Java over SQL, uh, so I'm going to actually do this a different way. Here in my main class, I'm going to create a new bean. So the bean annotation just says, hey, uh, this is a particular class. Uh, or a, a On this method, I want you to go ahead and create an instance of this and uh, go ahead and execute it. So there is a um, interface, a functional interface in Spring called the command line runner. And the command line runner is just something that we're able to use that, hap that is created after the application context is started and before the application is run. So this is a really good opportunity to do some kind of bootstrapping. In our case, insert some data into a database. So again, this is created after the application context is started, which means I can get an instance of that book repository. So what I'm going to do here is actually create um, a few books. And let's go ahead and import that. OK. So this list of books here is, let me just indent that. This list of books here is just a, a three books. So we're not going to create an ID. We're going to let the database do that for us. We give it a title, number of pages, the author, and the status. Oh, it looks like I did not start it instead of. Let's just fix that. So these are three books that we can insert. Now, uh, something else you may want to use in your application right away is logging, right? We may want to log some information as it happens. Pretty to do logging right out of the box in Spring Boot. We can come in here and I have a little shortcut for this just so I don't have to type it every time. But we can create a logger uh, using log4j. Um, no, this is not going to bring down your entire application. Those bugs have been uh, fixed. Um, so we can get an instance of our logger right here. And all I can do is say, hey, uh, we're going to go ahead and 
what I want to do is just get the titles. So uh, I'm using the uh, books collection right here, the books list. Um, and I'm just going to create a list of strings. Uh, so string titles, which is actu actually separated by a comma. And then I can use that logger to go ahead and log the info. So I'm logging that I'm inserting books, and I'm using those titles. So now I need to actually insert them. So again, I can use that repository that we created earlier. That repository has a save all method on it, which will take um, our iterable, which is in this collection of list. And so now we save a bunch of books. At this point, we have created the infrastructure. We created the model, the repository, the controller. Uh, we have a table that we can go ahead and insert data into. And here in the main application, we're creating a list of books, and we're going to insert them into the database. So if all goes well, we should be able to run this application and see that information in the console that we are inserting data. And oh, yay, demo gods. All right, so book repository could not resolve. So I probably did something wrong in the. Oh, I know what happened. So in the repository, when you define a list cred repository, you need to give it a uh, type. So if you look at this, uh, it takes a type and the ID. So in this case, this is a book, and we're using an integer. So small typo on my spot. All right, so if we go ahead and try and run this again. All right, so down here we see our log statement, inserting books. Here's our three books. And now um, one thing that we can do is because we've chosen H2 as our database, if we go into our uh, resources, if we go in here and we kind of declare a few properties that we're going to configure, um, one, of sor one of which is the data source name. So I'm going to say reading list. Uh, I want to not generate a unique name every time. And uh, what I can do is turn on the H2 console. So uh, with the H2 database, this is just a nice interface. You can go in and kind of look at the structure and contents of your database. So if I rerun this and go back to the browser, and look at this, um, I'm connecting to a specific URL. If we look in here, we now have a book table. If we go ahead and run some SQL against that, we have our three rows in the database. So essentially, we've created an application that um, can insert some data in the database. It also has an API endpoint. So remember, we can say API slash books. And that was the Git mapping to go ahead and retrieve a list of all of the records in the database. So we have our three books there. So we have a REST API. We have a way that we are connecting to the database. We're inserting some data. And that will kind of be the basis for our backend application at its simplest terms. Any questions about this before we kind of move on to the front end? The, the schema, so, so I, I added the schema file um, to, to, gen, to create that book table. Um, you don't need to do that. I mean, if you have an existing database with, database, you know, with tables already there, then you don't need to go off and create those, because um, uh, Yep. So as long and then there's if as long as you're using an in-memory database like H2, there's no extra steps. If you're using like Postgres or MySQL, you need to turn on one property. It's a uh, init mode is always uh, so that it knows to go ahead and look for that file and basically initialize the database for you to run that. And again, that that is a name that schema.sql is a is a convention that could be changed, but you can you can put in DDL in there, you can put in like, you know, if you want to insert a bunch of data, you can do that in there as well. Cool. Um, let's go back here. So, front end development. Um, I, you know, 
I've done a lot of back-end development over 20 years, over the 20 years that I've kind of done this. I've always enjoyed front-end development. I've always enjoyed kind of building for the web because you get that instant gratification of like, hey, I just built this thing and now I can see it up here. Um, you can show your mom or your wife. You can't really show somebody the back end of an API. They're like, what is this gibberish that you're showing me right here? So I, I've always been a fan of it. I've never been great at it. I feel like I've gotten better at it over the years. Uh, but it's something I've like, in, really enjoyed doing over my career. Um, what I want to talk about is kind of the, uh, kind of the landscape of front-end front -end development. We talked about a lot of the skills you might need earlier. I want to talk about kind of the landscape and, and what we're going to focus in on today. So again, we have our foundation, uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There are some more things that we kind of bring to this table, things like TypeScript. So if you are a Java developer and you're working on the front end and you need your types there and there's a lot of advantages of types, uh, we'll take a look at, at, at type, you know, some advantages of using TypeScript. You'll need to understand kind of Node and NPM. Uh, the last two are Webpack and Vite. So these are bundlers, build tools that allow you to do a bunch of things on the, on, on the front end. So we'll get into one of those today. Uh, you need to understand uh, editors. So I'm using IntelliJ for the back end, but I often use Visual Studio Code for a lot of the work I do on the front end, even though uh, if I have the same project in uh, IntelliJ. Uh, WebStorm has a lot of really good features. I'll use that as well. But you need to understand Chrome and how to use DevTools, how to use the command line, tools like Postman. Uh, frameworks. So from the CSS standpoint, there are some really great frameworks out there. I'm a big fan of Tailwind. Uh, Bootstrap is obviously one of the biggest. Uh, Balma I've used before, which I really enjoy as well. And then JavaScript. So the JavaScript framework world, there's a whole bunch of things that go into this, right? There's things like React and Angular and Vue and Svelte and Ember, and it feels like you know, new ones popping up all the time. Um, so we're going to kind of navigate this landscape today by focusing in on some of these things. I want to talk a little bit about JavaScript and, and where JavaScript has really come over the last, uh, say, 10 years. Um, we'll talk about TypeScript, Node, and NPM. Vite is really exciting. If you haven't heard about Vite yet, I, I, I'll be happy to introduce you to it today. Uh, we'll use Visual Studio Code just so we can kind of see the other side the, uh, of the full stack here. Um, I'm going to use a little bit of Tailwind, but we won't talk much about it today. And I'm going to use Vue. I'm a big fan of Vue. Um, nothing wrong. I, you know, again, the things that we're talking about today, uh, spe specifically with using Vue as like a component framework, are interchangeable with things like um, React and Svelte and a whole bunch of other things. So this is kind of what I'm going to focus on when we're building our application today. So as I said, I've been doing this a long time. And I've come from a time where writing JavaScript was not fun. Um, it, and I see some people laughing, and you're probably there with me. You know, one of the things that really kind of got me back into JavaScript was jQuery. Once that came along, it made, oh, this is actually really easy to do. I don't have to like, um, you know, I, I don't know if everybody remembers, there used to be a Bible to learn JavaScript that was like this thick, and Douglas Crawford Crack came out with JavaScript, the good parts, which was like this big. So there wasn't a lot of good parts of the language, but I feel like that's really evolved over the years. And I think this really started with kind of ECMAScript 2015, or as we refer to it as ES6. And this brought in a lot of really cool features, things like variable scoping. So we're using let and const, uh, avoiding hoisting of variables uh, in, our, in, our, in, our class, in our JavaScript files. Um, things like arrow functions, classes, destructuring allows us to say, hey, I just want this one um, property out of this huge object. I don't need to, one or two properties. I don't need to go ahead and create separate lines uh, to get that information out of there. Things like default pro parameters, rest parameters, spread, generators. Um, ECMAScript 2017 brought a sync and await, uh, a way to get object values and en en uh, entries. And ES9 brought a lot as well, or ES9 plus. So, Things like Promise Finally, um, huge JSON improvements, uh, Big Int, which is really cool. If you didn't know, um, when you kind of create a uh, just a huge number, if you open up DevTools, create a huge number and try to uh, compare it to itself, it's actually not equal. And there's those weird things that happen in JavaScript all the time. But Big Int brings in uh, a lot of good functionality there. Things like optional chaining and nullish coalescing. coalescing did I say that right? Um, so a lot of really cool features have come in JavaScript uh, 
uh, over the last, say, what, seven years now. Uh, a lot of this is thanks to modern browsers, right? No longer having to support the IE6s of the world, if anybody remembers those days. So we have modern browsers keeping up with the functionality and, and providing these features to us. So TypeScript, uh, again, TypeScript is open source. The current version is 4.7.4. JavaScript is a dynamic language, which is really great at times and really bad at times. It allows us to do some really wonky things, right? TypeScript is really just a superset of JavaScript. So any valid TypeScript or JavaScript, TypeScript is valid JavaScript. And it gives us a whole bunch of really cool features, one of which is static typing. So if you're used to working on Java, on the back end, this will um, really be a, a pleasure to work with on the front end. And with that static typing, we get a lot of benefits in our IDEs, right? We get things like code completion. We are, have the ability to do a bunch of refactoring that we're used to doing on the back end. Uh, compilation errors, if you try to add a number and a string, it's going to say, no, don't do this. So a lot of this is um, kind of what I, I like to keep referring to as shifting left. And like, let's catch these errors sooner rather than later. So this kind of helps us do that. So Vite, I mentioned it earlier. Vite is kind of a next generation of front end tooling. What I really love about it is it's framework agnostic. Vite was created by Evan Yu, the creator of Vue, but it's not Vue specific. If you want to create a vanilla JS project, you can. If you want to use React, Preact, uh, Svelte, Vue, whatever you want to use, um, it's framework agnostic. So I, I really enjoy that. Um, I know a lot of people who are React developers who used to use things like Create, create React uh, app have now moved over to Vite using it there. So this really takes advantage of native ES modules in the browser. Um, I use something called ES Build underneath the hood, which was written in Go. So it's extremely fast. Uh, because of that, we get an instant server start. So like as soon as we kick up our dev server, it's running. If you've ever used Webpack uh, in projects that have grown and grown and grown, you know that you know, sitting there trying to start a dev server and wait 10 seconds is not a lot of fun. So we get that instant server start. We get lightning fast hot module replacement. So when we go and change one thing, it doesn't need to kind of bundle the entire application again. Uh, we get that instant feedback of what we changed is now on the screen. Uh, we get some optimized builds. Uh, it uses roll up under the hoods to create that production build. We get some features out of the box, so we can import TypeScript right in uh, a file if we need to. We can use like, things like JSX and Vue, um, and a whole bunch of CSS features. So with that, what I want to do is just build a simple app using Vite, using Vue, that is now going to talk to that API that we built before. So the way that we'll do this. Oops, just updating that. So I'm going to start here in a folder. I'm going to start from the command line. I'm going to npm create Vite at latest. And this is going to say, all right, you want to create a new Vite project? What is the name of this project? I'm going to say front end. Again, it's going to ask us to select a framework. I'm going to select Vue. Um, you can use Vue or Vue and TypeScript. I'm just going to use Vue now, but i um, big fan, again, of TypeScript. And I like the support. You get that TypeScript support for whatever language you pick. So if you pick React, you can say, I want React TypeScript. So what we do now is we get um, some instructions here to CD into the front end, npm install. And normally, I would not be brave enough to npm install on conference Wi-Fi. But there are not a lot of dependencies here, which, uh, oh, wrong typo. NPM, what is that? Uh, oh, it did. Yeah, OK, sorry. <laughs> um, so normally I would not do that, but there are, one, one of the things I really appreciate a lot about these kind of starter templates is, are, are that they're very minimal. So when we open up this project, you'll see that there's not a lot of, uh, of code, not a lot of dependencies. Uh, but what I'm going to do is actually run NPM run dev, uh, because that's what it told us to do. And now we can go back to the browser. And, oops. and so this just creates a starter application. So this is using Vite in Vue. Uh, it's just a counter you can go through and click on there. Um, and then it says, hey, if you want to go ahead and edit components, hello world.view, you can test that out. You can see the hot module replacement happens really fast. 
Um, but what I'm going to do is go ahead and stop this. And what we're going to do is open this up in Visual Studio Code. So again, one of the things I really appreciate is kind of this minimal uh, project that we get. I don't like opening up a starter project with 50,000 things in it. Um, if you look at the package.json, there's just a few scripts and there are a few dependencies. So there's not a whole lot going on here. Uh, there's a vite.config. So this allows us to configure our applications. If you head over to this URL, you can learn more about how to configure it. Again, we kind of chose Vue, so Vue is a plugin. So if you wanted to create other plugins for this, you can. Uh, you'll notice that Angular wasn't on that list, but there is a plugin for Angular in the community that kind of allows them to use Vite with an Angular project. So there are a bunch of really cool plugins that you could take advantage of. So here is our, in our source folder. Oops. So under source, we have our app.vue. Uh, you can see that this is importing that Hello World. We're going to kind of get rid of a bunch of this stuff, and we're going to create a book list that is going to read uh, from that API that we created earlier. Real quick, I want to delete this uh, style. I don't want to use the styles that are in the base um, application. Actually, I can just delete that. OK, um, so the first thing I want to do in index.html, again, this isn't how you would do this in production, uh, but I'm just adding a Tailwind CD, CDN here for the demo so we can bring in Tailwind. In our components, I'm going to create a new component. We're going to call this bookslist.view. This is going to be a view file. And so back in app.view, we're going to import bookslist. And now what I'll do is go ahead and use this. OK, so now in book, books list, here in the template, I'm going to go ahead and generate some HTML so we don't have to watch me type all this out. But essentially what this is is some Tailwind that is going to create. We have this reading list. Here's a collection of books I'm currently reading. Uh, we have uh, this table with these headers. So for the ID, the title, the author, pages and status, I want to go ahead and display all of the rows that I get back from the database. So let's talk about how we might do that. So here I'm going to create a new um, books. And this is going to um, be a ref. So in uh, Vue 3, uh, using the composition API, we're basically setting this up as a reactive uh, variable here. So we're saying, hey, go pay attention to books. As it change, I want you to go ahead and reactively update it, uh, the DOM for me. So I have this books, and what I want to do now is um, there are these different life cycle events that happens in Vue, uh, one of which is on mounted. And this just says, hey, when the component is mounted, I want you to go ahead and execute this function. So what I'm going to do, um, that's actually pretty good. So this is GitHub Copilot in action. Uh, it's, I think it knows because I've typed this before, but it's actually telling me, hey, this is something you may want to do. Um, which is kind of scary, right? So what we want to do is actually call the full URL right now called localhost 8080 slash API slash books. We're going to get a response. We're going to turn that into, you know, we're going to get the JSON from that. Uh, and then we're going to set um, books.value equal to whatever that data is that's coming back. So with that, um, in view, we can kind of iterate over that. Uh, using a v4. So we're going to say book in books. And what I want to do is uh, I also need a key. This is book.id. And before we do anything, we just want to go ahead and display the ID. So book.id. So we'll fill out the rest of these in a second. Um, actually, let's just go ahead and fill these out. So this was the title, author, pages, and status. So book.title, book.author. Man, pretty soon I'm not going to even have to write code. This is great. So we're, these are kind of 
again, this V4 and view, if you're not used to view, it's just iterating over the collection of books that we have. The collection of books is when this component is mounted, it's going to use fetch, the fetch API underneath the hood, to go ahead and call our um, API, uh, get that response, and set it to our books. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and run this. So npm run dev. Now, if we go back to the browser, this is not going to work, but that's OK. So what we want to look at here is our console. And we get this error that we're probably used to seeing if you've done any type of work in full stack development, which is the lovely cores error. So this is basically, basically saying, hey, you are on localhost on both the front end and the back end, but you're using different ports here, right? So the browser security is saying, hey, we can't allow you to fetch from 5173 to localhost 8080. Uh, so on the Spring Boot side, I can fix this pretty easily. And then I'll also show you um, another fix that you can do on the front end to kind of configure cores without having to get around it. So on the book controller side, you can just say, hey, I want you to go ahead and accept anything here. And, you, know, you can get very specific with methods and URLs, what you're going to accept. But this will just kind of give us a quick way to accept any request there. So now if I go ahead and refresh this, can see that we're calling out to our API. We're getting, um, oh, it looks like I did not match that up well, huh? ID, ah. So, author. OK, so now it looks right. So now we have our three books that we're getting from our API. Um, so that's kind of the front end. There's also something, again, uh, that you can do in Vite uh, to kind of configure it so you can get around the whole cores issue. But I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a second. does not want to open. There we go. So let's talk quickly about the kind of architecture that we're working with here. Uh, in this case, what we're doing is, is traditional client-server architecture, right? We have this single page application that we built. Now, the application that we built on the front end was very basic. We could have done a lot more things on the front end. We could, especially in our view app there, we could add in things like routing and state management. Um, so we can have this full like single page application. And what we'll do is traditionally in this architecture, we're going to call out to an API. So we have that books API in Spring Boot. Um, and that's basically going to be used for um, talking to our database, talking to whatever data store that we need it to talk to, and return that data back to the client. We also, this one thing I love about this is this approach is it's fairly scalable. So if we decided that we built this huge monolithic app, our books API has like turned into this real big nightmare. Uh, we can go ahead and 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 change this. We if we decide we want to move to something like microservices, we can stick an API gateway in front. We can break our monolith up into different um, services, and now we can just talk to that API gateway. And again, I like this approach because it does scale well. There are some pros and cons to this approach, right? Uh, pros: ind independently deployable apps. This, for me, is the biggest one. If your front end is changing a lot more than your back end, this is important because now we don't need to like rebuild the entire application. We can just make changes on the front end, redeploy that, and we're not dealing with the kind of pipeline that we may have in the back end. Uh, low coupling, scalability, some cons. Again, it is independently deployable. There's more infrastructure that you're kind of managing, right? Local <coughs> development setup when you have you know, all these projects could be a little bit uh, tough. Performance, when we have separate apps like this, we need to make network calls, right? So now we're dealing with things like latency. And SEO on the, the front end um, could be a little bit uh, tricky, uh, depending on, on, on what you're doing. Um, I know there are things like uh, SSR on the front end, um, but that could be one con. 
So quickly, I want to talk about moving this to a monolith. So a software system is called monolithic if it has monolithic architecture, in which basically uh, fun functionally distinguishable aspects are all kind of interwoven rather than containing separate components. So now on our back end, our Spring Boot could be a monolith, but we can also kind of put all of this together, put our front end and our back end into a single monolith application. And what that looks like then is the client requests uh, something from our application, which is both a view and a Spring Boot application. That will talk to the database, figure out the HTML that it needs to render, and return that to the client. Some pros and cons to this. Uh, pros are single deployable assets. So when we kind of build our application, we just get a single jar, and we can go ahead and push that wherever we need to. So we can deploy that to the cloud. Again, simplicity, we have all this in, in one project. If, if, if I'm trying to onboard somebody, that makes it pretty simple. Uh, performance and SEO. The con is, again, a single deployable jar. If you need to change something on the front end, you're redeploying your entire application. So I just want to show this. We're not going to build this out, but I just want to show this um, kind of built out. One thing I'm doing on, um, so, so if you look in the project here, that same front end application that we built before is right in my source folder. So I have source front end, so that's the view application written with Vite. Then I have my source main Java, the same API that we built before. So we have all of this in uh, one convenient project. What we're doing here is we're using a couple of Maven plugins. This one is the um, front end Maven plugin, which will install Node and NPM. Uh, so it figures out what Node version you want to use, what NPM version you want to use. Uh, it has executions for NPM install. And if you run a build on uh, the, Vite pro the Vite application, uh, if you say NPM run build, it will basically create a, um, uh, you know, something that you can go ahead and take to production. So what we're saying here is, hey, that where we actually want to execute that is located in the source front end directory. All in all, what we're going to do is build the front end application and then go ahead and move that into target, classes, and static. And what we're moving there is whatever the front end application built in the dist folder. So we're taking the output of our front end application, sticking it in here. And if you've ever built a Spring Boot app, you know that anything in for, um, source main resources static now just gets served up as static. So when you go to localhost 8080, it will look for that index.html and go ahead and execute that. But again, what that allows us to do now is if we go ahead and open up a terminal and we say um, maven package, so it's going to go through. Uh, again, it's using those. Um, Spring, those Maven plugins, and what it's going to do is it's created uh, this jar. So we have um, under target, we have reading list, snapshot jar. So now what I can do is just say Java jar, target, reading list. And if I go ahead and run this, oh, we're still running on 8080, so let's stop. If I go ahead and run this, so you see that log there, inserting books. So now if I just go to localhost 8080, now I have the entire application in one. So the front end is being served up as that static application that we built, and it's simply calling the back end uh, application that we built uh, using that books API. So that's a pretty cool trick to, to go ahead and put those two together. Again, if you want to see a little bit more how that works, uh, in the repo, there's that front end application we built with Vite and Vue. The reading list is the kind of standalone application that we built with Java and Spring Boot. The reading list, reading list mono is both of them kind of put together uh, using those Maven plugins and, and building that single deployable jar. So that's all I got. Uh, you can contact me here, again, at the real Dan Vega on Twitter. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.